Hello everyone and welcome to the video presentation series of basic principles of laparoscopic surgery. The work is catered to MRCS candidates and junior trainees who may find this helpful. There is no conflict of interest and all videos were made for educational purposes only. These are the learning objectives of today which will serve as a guide and introduction to the basic knowledge of laparoscopic surgery. Laparoscopic surgery has established itself in the field of minimally invasive surgery over the past 30 years and has been involving since then. Benefits such as faster post-op recovery, reduction in length of hospital stay, and more importantly, avoiding large open wounds or incisions, thus decreasing blood loss, pain, and discomfort. Hence, patients have fewer unwanted side effects from analgesia, since overall less analgesia is required. First and foremost, patient positioning is an important initial preparation prior to commencing laparoscopic surgery or even any surgery. The main positions that we will be come across today are supine, Trendelenburg, Lloyd Davis, and reverse Trendelenburg, respectively. The key point of the Trendelenburg positioning is the patient is laid supine on a 15 to 30 degree incline with the feet elevated above the head. This position is frequently used in abdominal and genital urinary surgery. It allows better access to the pelvic organs as gravity pulls the intra-abdominal organs away from the pelvis. The disadvantages of Trendelenburg include diminished lung capacity, tighter volume, and pulmonary compliance. Venous pooling towards the patient's head and the danger of sliding and shearing of the body. Trendelenburg position should be avoided for extremely obese patients. Appropriate suction mattress and well-padded shoulder support ensure the patient position is constant at all times and to prevent shoulder nerve injury. Whereas in reverse Trendelenburg positioning, the patient is laid supine on a 15 to 30 degree incline with the head elevated above the feet as shown on the right side of the diagram. This position is employed to shift the intra-abdominal content caudally to facilitate upper laparoscopic abdominal surgery. Caution is advised to prevent the patient from sleeping on the table and more frequent arterial blood pressure monitoring is required due to venous pooling from the gravity effect. In addition, the position of head above the heart benefits from a reverse Trendelenburg position include increase in lung capacity, tidal volume, and pulmonary compliance as opposed to a Trendelenburg position. Next up, we have Lloyd Davis position as shown on the left side of the diagram, which is a commonly used position during emergency diagnostic laparoscopy to investigate lower abdominal pain in females. It is essentially a combination of Trendelenburg position with a hip flex at 15 degrees to facilitate access to the pelvis for any gynecological, urological, and colorectal procedures. However, there is an uncommon risk of bilateral compartment syndrome of the calves with Lloyd Davis position in prolonged surgery due to compromised lower limb circulation. We then now move on to how we gain access to the abdomen during the laparoscopic surgery. It is often known as the most dangerous part of the surgery as it is an invasive and blind procedure to some extent. Iatrogenic injuries such as viscous perforation, organs and blood vessel damage could occur if not done cautiously. The common techniques on gaining access to the abdomen are modified Hessen Veres needle insertion and visiport entry respectively. 
the modified hazard technique is often classified as the open technique where a small one to two centimeter incision is made either supra or umbilically with umbilical stock identified and elevated using a clip with dissection performed to expose the abdominal fascia at the base of the umbilical stalk. The abdominal fascia is raised with two sutures on both sides of the midline or using a second clip. This step is to maximize the distance from the underlying intra-abdominal organs. The fascia and the peritoneum is then incised in a controlled and progressive manner in order to maintain a truly open technique as opposed to bluntly pushing in the instruments which risks injury. A 5 to 10 millimeter troca and port is then generally inserted through this opening for scope to pass through. It is prudent to always bear in mind that iatrogenic injury of the aorta and the inferior vena cava probably occurred more often than they should. The alternative of abdominal access to achieve pneumoperitoneum prior to port insertion via a closed method would then be using a varus needle. It is a multi-component device consisting of a needle sheath assembly and a dilator cannula assembly. But just before we go into the detail of the insertion technique, this is a diagram which shows a few examples of varus needle insertion points such as the palmer's point, Li Huang's point, and the umbilicus respectively. The most commonly adopted insertion point would be the palmer's point which is 3 cm below the left subcostal region at the mid-clavicular line. Palmer's point is favoured because it almost has a zero risk of causing major vessel injury as well as ease of insertion in the very obese or very slim patient. Moreover, patients that have previous abdominal surgery will also benefit from Palmer's point insertion due to previous abdominal surgery has a higher adhesion formation risk and also carries an increased risk of visceral injury. Hence, the palmer's point will ensure a safe entry. On this slide, the picture on the left depicts the alternative insertion location for the varus needle, optical troca, and blunt troca with the approximate location of the epigastric vessels shown. The picture on the right with A demonstrating the transverse palmer point with C demonstrating the correct angle of varus needle insertion with B demonstrating the inappropriate angle of insertion. Now let's take a look at the workings of a typical varus needle. The needle sheet assembly is inserted into the peritoneal cavity as a conventional pneumoperitoneum needle would be, followed by abdominal insufflation. The needle is then withdrawn, leaving the sheath in place, and the dilator cannula assembly then is inserted through the sheath. The sheath itself is an expandable polymer that accommodates the dilator cannula while it is inserted. The dilator component is withdrawn post-insertion, leaving the 12mm cannula, which is still within the sheath, for laparoscopic instrumentation. The varus needle method is somewhat similar to the Saldinger technique used for central venous lines or enterostomy tubes. The apparent advantages of a radially expandable system include less abdominal wall trauma, due to a smaller facial incision compared to a non-dilating troca system and omit the need for suture of the fascia defect incurred by the device. 
Lastly, we have the visiport entry method as the name suggests of gaining the abdominal access by a bladed visiport port under direct vision. It is important to note that visiport shouldn't be used without a prior abdominal insufflation. The obturator has a clear blunt tip that houses an actuated knife blade as shown in the diagram. With each depression of the device trigger, the knife blade is fired out at 1mm and quickly retracts while the actual motion of the blade cannot be detected with the unaided eye. With the laparoscope inserted through the obturator and the obturator within the tissue of the abdominal wall, the surgeon fires the blade and watches the progress of the tip penetration on the video screen. Of the three optical ports described in this section, the visiport is the only one that is bladed. The next few slides is a series of diagrams showing each abdominal wall layer seen via visiport insertion. The layers are the skin, subcutaneous tissue, anterior rectus sheath, rectus abdominis, posterior rectus sheath, peritoneum layer, and lastly, peritoneum space. After going through a few different methods of gaining abdominal access, we will now take a look at the stage of gas insufflation in achieving pneumoperitoneum. Pneumoperitoneum is essential to provide sufficient working space intraperitoneally. Carbon dioxide is the gas of choice as it is inert, non-inflammable, as well as its solubility to allow excretion via expiration. Accepted range of insufflation pressure ranges between 12 to 16 millimeters of mercury. The point of note is that pneumoperitoneum can cause cardiovascular compromise manifested as hypotension or bradycardia via a reduction of venous return. If this is the case, pneumoperitoneum should be deserted until anesthetist deems safe to do so. That's the end of the part one of basic principles of laparoscopic surgery. Thank you very much and follow along the playlist for part two and three. Or feel free to browse the remaining video presentations covering a variety of MRCS topics and your feedback is much appreciated.